Well, hello again. Welcome to our service this Sunday morning, July 12th. It's good that uh, you're all here to join together uh, for another Sunday worship. Uh, I hope you've all been enjoying this, this stretch of very, very warm weather. And uh, I just want to especially thank, uh, welcome and thank those who are not n normally members, uh, connections with uh, St. Mark's Presbyterian Church. If you are a guest, a visitor, so to speak, uh, one of our virtual visitors, I'd like to extend a special welcome to you. And if you'd like some kind of connection or contact or would like to be uh, part of uh, St. Mark's in some way, you're more than welcome to contact us uh, if you go to our church website, uh, stmarkstoronto.org. Uh, then there are several contacts there, and uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so again, we welcome everyone uh, as we join together in this time of worship and praise this day. And now in joyful anticipation, let's come together for the call to worship. Gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit and blessed by God. We come to worship one holy God. O God, our own God, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. Your majesty is the music of the starry skies. In the name of the healer, the provider, and the enabler, let your gratitude and joy be made known. O God, our own God, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. And now let's join as we come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, you are the light of the minds that seek to know you. You are the strength of those who desire to serve you. You are the rest for those who seek you. O God, in whom we live and move and have our being, in worship we come and pause in your presence to rest from our work and responsibilities to rest from our distractions, to rest from our fears and concerns. Receive our offering of love and devotion this time of worship so that we might enjoy your care and mercy for us and the world you love. God of mercy, we confess it is so easy to be distracted from your truth. Preoccupied with our own comforts, we neglect to stand up for those who suffer. Tempted by what we desire, we fail to protect the earth and respect its limits. In your mercy, give us wisdom to walk in your ways, the will to seek things that truly matter and the grace to renew relationships with you and with one another. We worship and praise you this day and always. And this we pray in Jesus' name, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The spirit of life in Christ sets us free from the power of sin and death. Know that you are forgiven and live as forgiven people, forgiving one another. Thanks be to God. And now let's turn to one another in our hearts as we extend our peace, the peace of Christ uh, with all. And may the peace of Christ be with you. 
And now let's uh, prepare for our first hymn. It's number 65, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. Now let's join together for our responsive psalm reading, and that is Psalm 65, verses 1 to 8. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains, you are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. Amen. And now let's turn to our scripture reading as it is found in Romans chapter 8 and first 11 verses. And I'll be reading from the complete Jewish Bible. Therefore, there is no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are in union with Christ Jesus. Why? Because the law of the Spirit, which produces this life in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do by itself, because it lacked the power to make the old nature cooperate, God did by sending his own son as a human being with a nature like our own sinful one, but without sin. God did this in order to deal with sin, and in doing so, he executed the punishment against sin in human nature, so that the just requirement of the law 
might be fulfilled in us who do not run our lives according to what our old nature wants, but according to what the Spirit wants. For those who identify with their old nature set their minds on the things of the old nature. But those who identify with the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Having one's mind controlled by the old nature is death. But having one's mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind controlled by the old nature is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who identify with their old nature cannot please God. But you, you do not identify with your old nature but with the Spirit, provided the Spirit of God is living inside you. For anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. However, if Christ is in you, then on the one hand, the body is dead because of sin, but on the other hand, the Spirit is giving life because God considers you righteous. And if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then the one who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit living in you. Let us give God thanks for the blessing of this holy reading. As a teenager, uh, I attended a a large youth retreat. Um, I've attended so many retreats in my lifetime, hundreds, and I really enjoyed it, and it's really made an impact on me. And I want to share with you one particular experience, and it really doesn't involve me. It involves two other guys, two friends of mine, and I overheard a conversation. I mean, they weren't trying to be secretive, but uh, I I overheard this, and it really made an impact on me then, and it still impacts me today. My two friends, Joe and Bob, we'll call them, they were talking one evening. We were in a large room, and they were kind of um, in one corner, and I was kind of doing something in another corner. There were a few other people in that large room and, and they, were, they were speaking. And again, they weren't trying to be, they weren't trying to be private or anything, uh, but they were just engaged in this, this deep, deep, personally meaningful conversation. And what they were talking about, specifically what Joe was saying, was that he was trying so hard to be a better Christian, to be a better teenage boy, to walk better in his faith. And he was so frustrated with himself because he kept falling, he kept failing, he kept making mistakes. And he complained that, uh, he complained about all kinds of mistakes, social mistakes, spiritual mistakes, the wrong things that he says, the wrong things that he does. He, I guess he had a tendency to not shoot off his mouth, but just kind of say things off the cuff that was uh, insensitive. And he often offended people. And in certain moments of reflection, he was so frustrated with himself. And so, Uh, Joe and Bob were there and Joe was just kind of beating himself up like he was just so so passionate about his his desire to do better and how frustrated he is that he couldn't do better and so some of the things I overheard was I'm so stupid why do I keep doing these things why can't I just stop why can't I do better I know the right thing to say but I say the wrong thing. 
I keep trying my best, but I keep failing. I mean, mind you, we were, I think we were about 17, maybe 16, 17. And it's not very common to hear young guys talk like this to each other. And as Joel was expressing his frustrations about himself, Bob was there. He was comforting him. I mean, these guys were pretty elite athletes. You know, they weren't, you know, they weren't, uh, they weren't weak in, in any sort of way. They weren't emotionally weak, psychologically weak, physically weak. I mean, they were, they were tough guys, as we understand that term. But it was a really tender moment, and Bob was there just trying to encourage him to say, you know, you got to keep trying. You know, God is here for you. You know, don't be so hard on yourself. You just got to you just got to hang in there. And as I was overhearing this conversation, I mean, they were friends of mine, as I said, I was really moved. I was really moved. I was inspired. I was encouraged. And it's one of these things. You know, this is the kind of, uh, this is one of the reasons and examples why youth retreats were so meaningful to me, because sometimes moments like this happen where you just stop and you really are invited to reflect on your own faith. And even to this day, obviously, decades later, I still remember that incident. And it still impacts me, it still inspires me. So I have some questions for you, for us to reflect on. How do we navigate Christian faith? What's our understanding of spiritual living that pleases God? What are those things that drive us to want to live for Christ? What is our fundamental motivation to follow him? And what do we expect? What are our expectations from this experience as Christians? I hope we understand, first of all, first of all, that Christianity is not just a, a one-time singular event. I made my commitment back then, and so I'm good to go for the rest of my life. It's done, it's over with, and I'm just sailing, smooth sailing. It's not a singular event. Rather, it's a process. It's a lifelong process that we intentionally live each and every day. And this is the kind of life that Jesus invites us to. And we read about this all throughout the New Testament. Jesus inviting people to this kind of life, way of life, lifestyle. Now, there may be an initial event or an experience that brought you to the faith. And that's great. But that experience is lived out. It's worked out for the rest of our spiritual lives. The reason for this is that learning, learning to live the faith and follow Christ in your life is something that is continuously worked out. We mess up, we fail, we fall, and then we learn and we grow and things go on. And in this process, sometimes we succeed and experience transformative learning and sometimes we fail miserably, just like Joe. And when this happens, we get up and we offer ourselves to God once again. We pick up our cross and carry on. And so the question that we each have to tackle is, what is it that you truly desire of the faith for your life? What is it that you truly desire of the faith for your life? What do you want out of it? Do you want 
spiritual maturity or growth, authentic transformation, or do you just want to spiritually coast, just coast along? And so I, I want to briefly describe these two tracks, the growth track or the coast track. Do we commit ourselves to growth or do we just want to coast along? And so if we look at our Romans text, on the coasting track, on the coasting track, verse 5, it says, you identify with your old nature. That makes you comfortable the way you were before. You identify with your old nature and set your minds on the things of the old nature. On the growth track, it says, you identify with the spirit and set your minds on things of the spirit. That is your focus. That is your orientation. That is your devotion. Again, on the coasting track, verse 6, having one's mind controlled by the old nature is death. Is that your orientation? On the growth track, having one's mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. On the coasting track, verse 7, your mind controlled by the old nature is hostile to God because it doesn't submit itself to God's law. It says you can't please God. On the growth track, verse 9, the Spirit of Christ dwells in you and therefore you belong to Him. You receive true life from the Spirit because God, God considers you righteous. You know, Joe was on the growth track. No matter how many times he thought he failed. And the reason why he's on the growth track is because he knew he failed. He knew it. He realized it. If he weren't on this track, number one, he wouldn't know that, and he wouldn't care. But Joe definitely cared. He wanted to do better. He tried to do better. His orientation was on true change so that his life could be a pleasing offering to God. In other words, he was trying his very best, even to the point of getting upset with himself, beating himself up because he knew, he knew he could do better. And he knew that God knew that Joe could do better. Is this a familiar experience for us, doing our utmost to live and do and speak in a way that you know is faithful to your calling as Jesus' disciple. Is that what sits at the core of who you are? On the coasting track, we say things like, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. But hey, this is who I am. And I'm not going to apologize for that. And I'm not going to change. And if you don't like it, too bad. I've heard that from so many people over the years. Yeah, I'm a Christian. And I'm, I'm happy with wearing that as a label. But I don't have to be on that track. I can stick with my old ways, old habits, old thinking. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. Now, people may accept us as we are, no doubt. Other people may accept us as we are. But the point is, we have established the terms. 
We have drawn the spiritual line in the sand and we demand implicitly or explicitly that others accept us on our terms only. We are the ones who dictate things. And if we look at Romans, if we look at this text, this way of thinking accords perfectly with the old nature description where it says in verse 8 and 9, you set your mind on and identify with the old nature. You identify with the old nature. And without the Spirit of Christ, you can't please God. Now, I'm not talking about gratuitously putting yourself down or self-abuse and just beating yourself up all the time, like, like if that's how you saw what Joe was doing to himself. So I'm not saying you got to be that harsh on yourself. But like Joe, it's really about striving towards your authentic self in God, where you know that there's something better for you, about you. This is not who God wants you to be. You can become something more striving towards your authentic self in God, not according to your old nature, but in God. You know where you're negligent in your life, and you want to do better for God and for others. Or are we usually pretty happy and smug with ourselves? And that's other people's problem. Are we just coasting spiritually? The path of Christ, the path of Christ is a perilous path. Following Jesus is a perilous proposition. Now, what does that mean? What do I mean by that? Well, the word the word perilous means it's unsafe, risky, dangerous, vulnerable. It makes you exposed. Isn't that what Jesus is talking about? Isn't that what our faith really is all about? Why would we want that for our life? Because a perilous path reflects the nature of our journey. It reflects the very essence of our faith in God and our relationship with God. Repentance, confession, renewal, challenge, change, transformation, these are all risky and dangerous and vulnerable things. And yet in Christ, this is what we have accepted for ourselves. Make no mistake, coming to Christ is accepting these things for ourselves willingly. No one has done that for you. Your parents have not done that for you. Society has not done that for you. Your minister has not done that for you. You have chosen this. You have chosen this perilous path, whether you realize it or not. Joe realized it. We all need to realize this. This is what we have committed ourselves to for God's vision for us and the world. And this is the invitation which we have answered with our whole heart, mind, and soul. It is the growth track. It is the perilous path. 
And so what is our calling as Christians? What has Christ commanded us to do if we are truly his disciples? Is being a Christian easy, convenient, comfortable, a nice fit for you, something to coast along for? Or is it something that challenges us, awakens us, ignites us, makes us uncomfortable because it calls us to change our attitudes? It calls out our prejudices, our bigotries, and makes us see with different eyes and hear with different ears and feel with a different heart. That's pretty perilous. Life on this perilous path is a life that invites risk into our lives. We reveal our true selves before God. We make ourselves open and vulnerable to change. We're calling on God to do something to us that very well might make us uncomfortable as the person we are right now because we commit ourselves to becoming what God wants us to become. And I think that description really fits Joe well. He knew, he knew he was on a perilous path and he accepted it. And he could not give up on himself because God doesn't give up on him. In this sense, to be on this perilous path is dangerous and shattering to our spiritual comfort zone. We all have it. It may be different from one another's comfort zone, but we all have it where we feel safe, secure, kind of, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back in a spiritual sense. This is the way I like things. This is the way I want to keep things. Our spiritual comfort zone. But we are here now, according to Romans. We're here now. And being here reveals our trust in God's purpose for our lives and expresses our hope in Christ and the renewal of the world through us. You see, for all this to happen, God wants, God needs transformed people. And so in this transformative process, we risk changing our own thinking, our conduct, our behavior, our outlook. We risk changing our relationships with people, the way we relate to one another, to see and embrace all people just as God does not on our own terms, but as God does. Love one another. Love them as you would love yourself. Prioritize them as you would place yourself in your own priority. And this is God's mind, God's heart. We risk being shaken out of self-righteous contentment to realize, like Joe, hey, you know, that particular thing about me that's not so great, yeah, that has to change. That's why it's dangerous to our spiritual comfort zone. We always run a risk when we walk the perilous path. And so being here with Christ is a dangerous proposition when you truly think about it because it tears us 
It rips us away from our comfort zone. And we open ourselves up to all that can change us according to God's goodwill. We know that King David was by no means a good man. He committed all kinds of violence and sin. In one of his more profound, reflective, and penitent moments, he realized, he realized that he can't continue to live by hate, vengeance, bigotry, pride, and arrogance. He knows that he's not immune to God's rebuke. And so he comes to the point where he prays, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let us pray this perilous prayer together. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, as hard and as uncomfortable as this can be, we pray that you would search us. We too speak the words of David as he prayed. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my motives. Reveal to me my anxious thoughts. Show me anything in me that offends you. O God, I want to see in me what you see in me so I can become more like Jesus. So search my heart, O God. Amen. Let's join in the hymn singing number 385, like the murmur of the dove song.
Let's come together in prayer before God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you formed the earth to be a place of joy and abundance for all your creatures. For food in all its variety and the people who grow it, transport it, and market it, we give you thanks. These days of pandemic have shown us how much we depend on others. We pray for those who do not have enough food and for those whose agricultural supply is at risk through extreme weather, uncertain prices, and social upheaval. Help us care for the earth in its fruitfulness and for each other in our common need of its fruit. We know that there are so many vulnerable people around us, so many places where resources are not shared fairly. Where there is division, bring conviction in people's hearts, however painful or discomforting, for justice needs to prevail. O God, where people are tired and anxious, bring strength and courage. Where people are distracted, grant wisdom to see what is truly important. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, you call us to be communities held together by prayer and love for our neighbors. And so we lift up one another now. We pray for John King. We pray for Diane and Tom Kingston. We lift up the Reverend Erin Coe and her whole family. We pray for Ray Kirchin. O oh God, where people mourn loss of any kind, provide comfort. Where there is illness and pain, bring healing. Where there is distress or discouragement, transform fear into hope. By your Spirit, equip us to serve one another in Christ's name so that your compassion touches lives with love and mercy. These things we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And now let's join together in our invitation to offering. God invites us to be generous with our time, our talents, and our resources so that God's word spreads in the world and bears fruit in each life it touches. Let us give generously in care and mercy, sowing seeds that will lead to harvest of renewed lives. So we're invited to give now. Uh, if, you, if you wish, you can go back to the front page of our church website, stmarkstoronto.org, Saint and there is a, a donation button there. And we, we would appreciate uh, your, your giving, your support uh, in this ministry. And also for the YouTube page, if you haven't noticed, there is a subscribe button uh, just on the lower right hand corner and so please feel free to click that button and you are a subscriber to uh, our church youtube page and that will allow you to it it, it lists all the videos there uh, for you uh, and so you're more than welcome to do that as well <laughs> So thank you for your continuing support uh, in this ministry and into the ministry of 
Christ. So let us pray together. Generous God, we bring the gifts we have to offer to you, seeds of goodness you planted in our lives, which have flourished. Bless and multiply them. Help us to choose wisely how they can best serve your purposes in our church and in your world. Amen. And now for our final hymn, it's number 632, Help Us Accept Each Other. And now we come together for our final blessing, our benediction. The compassionate God who heals all your iniquity, bless and keep you. The face of the loving God who heals all your afflictions, shine upon you and be gracious to you. The light of the countenance of the merciful God who redeems your life, be lifted upon you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.